Welcome. Welcome everyone here in this room. Welcome to those of you watching on video in the overflow room and welcome to everyone watching online through the live stream. It's a great, great pleasure this morning for me to welcome the Honorable Michelle Lee to speak here at Stanford Law School. Before I introduce her, let me just mention a couple of logistical details. Uh, Ms. Lee will speak for a while, then we'll take some questions from the audience. All of you should have had a three by five blank card on the uh, table in front of you, both here and in the overflow rooms. If you have a question or questions, please fill them out on the card and then just raise your hand. There should be people in each room looking for you who will collect all of them. They'll then bring them uh, into this room and we'll sort of put them all together. That will give us a chance to make sure we ask questions from people in each of the rooms and not just those of you here in this room. So if you don't mind, put your questions down on paper, uh, hand them in, and we'll make sure we get to as many as we possibly uh, possibly can. Uh, our talk today is co-sponsored by Stanford Law School, by the Stanford Program in Law, Science, and Technology, by the Jules Guard Intellectual Property and Innovation Clinic, which I direct, uh, and by the Silicon Valley Intellectual Property Law Association and CPA Global. So thanks to them, thanks to all the co-sponsors for making this uh, uh, happen. Also in front of you on the table, you should see that there's uh, an executive actions card from the PTO. Take a look at this. This lays out, and I'm sure Ms. Lee will talk about this more, but this lays out uh, a lot of the sort of direct action that the PTO uh, is and has been taking. Um, so we really couldn't be more thrilled to have Ms. Lee here with us uh, to speak at Stanford uh, this morning. First of all, she's a graduate of this fine law school, very important to mention. Uh, as you know, she's also Deputy Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Deputy Director of the USPTO. In the absence of a permanent director of the Patent Office this year, Ms. Lee has been performing the leadership and oversight functions and duties of the director since January, which means she oversees the day-to-day -day management of the policy, budget, uh, operations for the PTO, which most of you probably know is an agency with over 12,000 employees. She also serves as the principal advisor to the Secretary of Commerce on domestic and international IP matters and works to promote innovation domestically and promote harmonization efforts internationally. Before becoming deputy director, Ms. Lee was the first director of the Silicon Valley office of the PTO here in the Valley. And before the PTO, she spent most of her professional career advising innovative companies on technical, legal, and business matters, including uh, as deputy general counsel for Google and the first head of patents and patent strategy at Google. And before that, as a partner at Fenwick here in the Valley, where she specialized in advising clients on patent law, IP, litigation, and corporate matters. Before that, she clerked for Vaughn Walker in the district court in San Francisco and for the federal circuit. Um, and before that, before law school here, she received her BS and MS degrees in electrical engineering from MIT. And she worked as a time for a computer scientist at HP Research Labs, as well as at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. So Ms. Lee has a really remarkable background. Uh, and as you all know, this is also a really remarkable time for patents and for the patent system. I personally have never seen patents broadly uh, so often or so thoroughly in the news, including not just the specialized stuff that so many of us read, but the, the popular press, newspapers and magazines. Um, There's a tremendous amount of activity ongoing around patent reform, revisions to the patent system. And the Supreme Court has been paying a lot of attention to patents lately, as you all know, including deciding six patent cases this term. Uh, Alice v. CLS Bank just a week ago, as well as a number of cases in recent terms. So there really couldn't be a better time to hear from the head of the PTO and to learn her perspectives on speaking truth to patents, the case for a better patent system. So please join me in welcoming the Honorable Michelle Lee to Stanford Law School. <laughs> Everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Professor Malone, for that very kind introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. First, I'd like to thank all of you for being here, those of you who are in this room, and also those of you who are in what I understand to be two overflow rooms. So thank you for being here. It's an honor and privilege to be back at Stanford Law School. 
to be speaking in this very lecture hall where I first learned intellectual property law from Professor Goldstein more than a few years ago. Stanford was where I took the path less traveled for an engineer and became a patent lawyer. So it's a fitting place for me to reflect upon the first six months as the head of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. As Professor Malone mentioned, this is an exciting time to be involved in intellectual property law and policy for a number of reasons. The growing importance of intellectual property to our economy, the continuing implementation of the America Invents Act, and the increasing awareness of abusive patent litigation and the public and private efforts to combat it. When I graduated from this law school, the Federal Circuit was still relatively new. And patent law was the province of a handful of specialists who practiced in patent boutiques and not general practice law firms. Engineers like me were much more likely to think of a PhD program, medical school, and not law school. And even in the legal universe, patent law was treated like a faraway planet with an eccentric orbit, the two rarely coming into contact. And citizens of planet patent might well have been aliens to everyone else in the legal universe. So during this time, patent law received little scrutiny from the courts and generalist lawyers, much less the general public. It was a cozy little world where people knew each other personally and oftentimes did not have varying policy positions. Patent issues were discussed only in specialist trade journals and certainly not in the mainstream press. Presidents tended not to mention patents in their State of the Union addresses, and the Supreme Court rarely granted review of patent cases. Since then, much has changed. As innovation generally, and patent-protected innovation more specifically, have become well-known drivers of our economy, what used to be a quiet little corner of the law has become quite a busy place. The Supreme Court regularly hears patent cases, and big general practice law firms vie to grow their patent litigation and prosecution practices. And the increased prominence of patents in our society means that not only are there more people in this previously quiet little corner, but there are a broader range of stakeholders than ever before. As the patent world has grown, so too has the quality of the conversation. In general, more conversation is a good thing, but an increasingly divisive tone is not. Today, we routinely hear stakeholders labeling, labeling each other as pro-patent or anti-patent, though it's far from clear what those terms mean. They add nothing to the conversation other than to provide an easy way to label someone with whom you disagree. Moreover, some harbor a mistrust of recent arrivals to the patent universe, a kind of intolerance that suggests that there is no place for them in the conversation. Yes, there are some industries who are new to the patent world, but that's because they're new to the world, period. And people who favor innovation should favor their inclusion. Let's not forget that even the most iconic inventor like Thomas Edison was once a newcomer to the patent world. And there are some individuals who have not joined us voluntarily, but are members of the patent world because they purchased and used off-the-shelf products made by others, and on that basis have received demand letters accusing them of patent infringement. Now they, too, have an indisputable stake in our patent system. If we are to have a reasoned, serious debate about the shape of our patent system, it's important that we cut through the fog of harsh and unproductive language. There's too much work to be done to let mistrust and skepticism get in our way. And with that in mind, let me lay my cards on the table. As many of you know, I'm a longtime user of the patent system. I was a computer scientist 
at a research laboratory just down the street, not too far from here. I've represented inventors and innovative businesses. I've represented patent plaintiffs and patent licensors. And I now head the agency that is responsible for examining and issuing patents. That said, I've been on the other side of countless demand letters and lawsuits from patent holders and have spent a good part of my career representing patent defendants and licensees, including against so-called patent trolls. In fact, I've even argued on behalf of my clients that certain patents should not have issued. Now, I wouldn't call myself anti-patent, nor would I call myself pro-patent, whatever those labels mean. But let me be clear, I am without reservation pro-patent system. What do I mean by pro-patent system? It means I believe that a strong patent system is essential to fostering innovation that drives our economy. I recognize that our patent system is not something that exists in the state of nature, but is the result of policy decisions made by Congress and the courts that weigh the costs of patent exclusivity against the benefits. We are constantly re-examining those policy decisions to make sure that the benefits continue to outweigh the costs. I believe that for the most part, the benefits do outweigh the costs. But we need to be clear about what those benefits and what those costs are, and about the realities underlying innovation today. Patents are not the only drivers of innovation. The first entity to bring a product to market has a first mover advantage that provides an incentive to innovate on its own, whether or not a patent is sought or granted. Some firms opt for an open source model where they benefit from the network effects of widespread adoption of the technology they've developed. We also know that reputation and branding, with or without a trademark, plays a large role in facilitating innovation. And of course, large numbers of innovations are protected by trade secrets or copyrights, and not patents. And yet, patents still play a critical role in promoting innovation. Patent exclusivity, that is, the right of a patent owner to exclude others from using the patented invention, provides a unique route for inventions to find their way to the marketplace. Even with a patent, an inventor requires access to capital, developing a prototype, finding uh, channels of distribution, and more before he, and increasingly she, can find its way to the marketplace. Exclusivity protects the competitive position of a new entrant to a marketplace, which in turn attracts investment. And that plays an essential role to inventors and investors. It gives them the confidence that they need to take the risks necessary to launch products and to start businesses. Now, critics of our patent system point to the patent's grant of exclusivity as a monopoly. And they are right but only to a limited extent. That grant of exclusivity inhibits competitors and allows an owner to charge supra-competitive prices, but only for a limited period of time. But we accept the monopoly because of our strong conviction that the long-term benefits to society outweigh the costs. Innovation today means more innovation tomorrow. And the higher the prices that we pay for patented goods and services today, or an investment for our future. The history of federal technology transfer provides a useful example. Before 1980, with few exceptions, the federal government did not grant exclusive licenses to its patents. That led to fewer than 5% of those patents being licensed. So the vast majority of federally funded research was not finding its way to the market where it could promote economic development. After President Carter signed the Bayh-Dole Act into law in 1980, federal agencies could grant exclusive licenses to federally owned patents. As a result, we saw an explosion of commercialization of federally funded research 
enabling, for example, so many of the breakthroughs in the pharmaceutical and information technology space that we take for granted today. By one study's account, approximately 154 new FDA drugs were approved since 1980 that resulted from federally funded research. And on the IT side, federally funded research resulted in the PageRank method of ranking search results that Google so famously and exclusively licensed from Stanford University. So we have seen the difference that exclusivity makes. We have seen the commercialization enabled by that exclusivity, sustaining jobs, driving our economy, and raising our standard of living. We may have borne the cost in the form of increased prices, but we've received something in return because those exclusive rights enable the private sector to take risks and to bring the products to the marketplace. And there, I think, most of us would say that the benefits of our patent system outweigh its costs. These benefits are supported by a robust system of licensing and technology transfer that gets patent rights into the hands of those who are best able to commercialize it. We all recognize that universities and federal government play an enormous role in supporting basic research and development and that their ability to license the technology often enables them to fund further development and future breakthroughs. Litigation is an inefficient way of conducting licensing negotiations. But the ability to defend and maintain exclusivity granted by a patent is at the end of the day an essential element. Litigation is not only the final refuge for legitimate patent holders, it also provides an essential backdrop against which licensing negotiations take place. I am, as I said, pro-patent system. And that means I mean, I'm in favor of putting the patent system first. And if there is a bug in our system, I think it ought to be fixed. So when patents are used not to help bring products to the market, but rather to extract cost of litigation settlements from companies and end users inexperienced in the ways of our patent system, the careful balance of costs and benefits underlying our patent system is threatened. In these circumstances, patents are not being used to promote the progress of science and the useful arts as intended by our constitution and our founding fathers. And it imposes a cost of monopoly without greater benefits. And these costs are real, not just for the parties involved in the particular dispute or litigation, but to the economy as a whole. Economists have studied this issue and found that this is a multi-billion dollar problem. That's a significant cost for American businesses to bear without the public benefits that arise when an invention is commercialized. Unfortunately, this shapes how many people think of the patent system today. They don't see a driver of innovation or a force for economic growth. They see a sideshow to innovation. And for those of us who care about the patent system, this is a concern. Litigation costs are normal frictions in any marketplace. But abusive litigation is a flaw in an otherwise great system. It takes the system that we've built together and makes it subject to abuse and injustice. If we care about the system, we have to bring together our resources and our experience on how to address this problem before it threatens to undo so much of what we've all worked so hard to achieve. Working towards that solution will require thinking about the patent system as a whole, with input from all stakeholders, patent applicants and patent holders, patent plaintiffs and patent defendants, judges, businesses, small and large, across all industries, universities, and the general public. Not everyone may own a patent but we are all the intended beneficiaries of our patent system. To those of us who have worked in the patent world for a while, 
any change can appear threatening. Changes to the patent system upset our expectation and force us to revisit how we do things. But we should never buy into the illusion that our patent system is set in stone and that it has been all downhill since 1952 when President Truman signed into effect the Patent Act. Our system always has been subject to revision, not only by the courts, but by all three branches of government. In 1999, we had the American Investors Protection Act. In 2011, it was the America Invents Act, which took us from a first inventor to file system, introduced new post-grant proceedings, and provided the PTO with the model of sustainable funding. So I reject the suggestion that any efforts to fix the problem of abusive patent litigation will break the entire system. Our patent system has proved itself more resilient than that. It can tolerate change when needed. So what can we do to make a better patent system? There are things we can do before a patent has issued, but there are also things we can do after the patent is granted as well. We need to fix the problem of abusive patent litigation, but we need to do so without diminishing the rights of legitimate patent holders. This can and should be achieved through multiple ways. <coughs> Legislatively, through congressional action. Judicially, through rulings from the court. Administratively, through actions by the United States Patent and Trademark Office and other federal agencies. And of course, with input and actions from all of you. President Obama recognized the need for patent reform early and has brought a great deal of public awareness to the issue. Over the last year, the administration has announced a number of executive actions designed to level the playing field of and bring greater clarity to the patent system. There are over a half dozen executive actions in total, and I will touch upon a few of the newer ones shortly. But I encourage you to go to our website for a full explanation of each of the executive actions and the USPTO's progress to date on each of them and how you can contribute. On your chair or in front of you at your desk is a card with the URL to the website. Please do check it out. And of course, the administration supported and still supports legislative patent reform. Last June, the president announced seven legislative recommendations designed, among other things, to increase the transparency of patent ownership information, to curtail abusive patent litigation, and to ensure the highest quality patents possible in our system. In December, the House of Representatives passed the Innovation Act with strong bipartisan support designed to accomplish some of these goals. This year, the Senate Judiciary Committee also worked hard to craft comprehensive legislative patent reform to build on the work of the House. As most of you probably heard, progress on the Senate bill has been put on hold for now. This is, of course, disappointing to those of us who have worked so hard over the past year to achieve meaningful and balanced legislative patent reform. At the same time, though, let us not forget that the America Invents Act took 10 years to pass with many fits and starts. Just because change does not come quickly does not mean change does not come at all. On the judicial front, courts are making progress on important clarifications and developments in patent and patent litigation related case law. As many of you know, the Supreme Court recently issued a number of opinions that have already impacted and will continue to have impact on a number of the legislative priorities. So for example, we've seen the Supreme Court in the Octane and Highmark cases make it easier for district courts to award attorney's fees in patent cases. We've already seen trial courts use this more flexible standard to award fees in cases that warrant it. And in the recent Nautilus case, the Supreme Court adopted the position the administration took in its brief, which establishes a higher standard of patent claim clarity. This is a win for all of us, because having fewer ambiguous patents 
leads to less abuse of litigation and more innovation. And just a week ago today, as Professor Malone mentioned, CLS Bank, uh, through the Supreme Court, held that all claims to the patent at issue were ineligible under Section 101. While the ruling does not create a bright line prohibition against any category of patent, such as business method or software-related patents, it likely lays the groundwork for more aggressive challenges to these types of patents, as litigants test the boundaries of the CLS Bank ruling. The fact that courts are addressing some of the same issues that Congress is considering is a good thing, because conversation about how to build a better patent system should not be confined to just one way of improving the system, whether legislative, judicial, executive, or otherwise. All of us play a role in, make us, in making our patent system the best it can be. And that's why it's so important that we listen to each other and we embrace improvements wherever they may come from. While Congress and the courts are doing their part, it's essential that the rest of us do ours. In addition to the measures that the administration is taking now, the PTO has a longer term role to play in ensuring the health of the patent system. And that has to do with improving patent quality. Issuing high quality patents can play a significant role in curtailing abusive patent litigation now and in the future. To that end, I've made improving patent quality a top priority at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Now, this may sound familiar to you, and that's because proving, improving patent quality has always been at the core mission of the USPTO. But for too long, due to uncertain budgetary conditions, the PTO has had to make do with less. Despite best of intentions, we've had to accept trade-offs between quality and backlog and pendency, forcing us to cut programs and shift resources to maximize the output without minimizing quality. But today, thanks in large part to efforts by my predecessors to achieve a sustainable source of funding and a reduction in our backlog and our pendency, for the first time in a long time, the USPTO doesn't have to just make do. We have the opportunity to build that world-class patent quality system. The American Invents Act gave the PTO fee-setting authority. And working with our shareholders, we created an operating reserve fund for the fees we collected. This means that we are now able to launch new initiatives in response to our customers' needs with the confidence that we can sustain these efforts even during fluctuations in our funding. So it's time to think big. There's no silver bullet or easy answer on how to create a world-class patent quality system. It means we have to keep all options on the table, big and small, before examination, during examination, and after examination. Everything from major upgrades to our IT tools that our examiners use, to giving our examiners more time to perform certain tasks during the examination process, to benchmarking our patent quality initiatives against those of our peers in foreign countries. Thinking big means finding better ways to utilize internal expertise within the PTO. In the past, we've leveraged the skill and efficiency of our most experienced examiners to examine more patents with the goal of reducing our backlog. But today, we now have the option to use them as long-term force multipliers for our examination core by having them spend more time coaching and training our junior examiners, not just when they walk in the door, but throughout the examination process, these coaches have the potential to increase quality of examination across the board in a force multiplying way. Thinking big also means looking at how we can bring the lessons of big data to the PTO. We collect a lot of data during patent examination process. But until now, we haven't had the resources to use it to its fullest potential. We do now. Now we have the resources not only to analyze the data effectively, 
but to take the lessons that we learned from it and feed them back into the earliest stages of examination to improve quality of examination from our first touch of a patent application. The data will allow us to better tailor our existing training programs, to build more new, more effective programs, and to remeasure the results of the training and programs and feed this back at every stage of the examination process. And as with any big data project, there are elements of serendipity. We may find things in the data that we hadn't even thought about, and that may point us in new and different directions. Further, in order to measure the results, we need, of course, to talk about what quality means to our customers. And it's not enough for us to have this conversation simply within the walls of the PTO. This is a conversation that we need to have with you, the public. And we have plans to do so formally starting this fall through a series of discussions that will be held across the country. But we're not just talking. We're also doing. I'd like to share with you several initiatives that are already underway. First, we're redoubling our efforts to train patent examiners on the latest technological developments. We've expanded our patent examiner technical training program that brings outside experts to the PTO to train our examiners, and we've made it easier for you, your companies, and your experts to participate. This is an opportunity for all of you to make a difference right now, and we encourage your participation. In addition, our examiners, uh, keeping our examiners current on the state of the law is also a core part of our mission, and we're taking our executive action to increase patent claim clarity very seriously. We've developed and implemented four new training modules focused on functional claiming under Section 112F, which is frequently used for software-related patents. Second, based upon input we received through the software partnership, we've launched a voluntary glossary pilot program that is designed to enhance patent claim clarity during the application process and after patents have issued. Starting this month, if you can receive expedited processing of your patent applications if your applications contain definitions of technical terms that are used in your claims. Third, we're looking for even more ways to engage the public before a patent has issued. In February, the administration announced a new executive action to expand the ways in which the public can help examiners find the most relevant prior art through crowdsourcing. Many of us use the internet to harness the power of the, the crowds. And I'm excited to say today that the USPTO is taking steps in this direction. After all, some of the best technologists in the world sit outside the walls of the USPTO. So what better way is there to learn about the prior art to, than to ask the experts themselves, the artists themselves? I've said a lot about the role the public has to play in helping to create a better patent system not only because it's a critical role, but because it's important for us to remember that the patent system ultimately belongs to the public. So, though legislative efforts to fix the problem of abusive patent litigation may have to wait, as you can see, the administration is not waiting. We are moving forward to further improve our patent system now and for the future. In closing, I'd like to revisit something I've said earlier. As what used to be the small world of patent law has now become larger, more visible, and more consequential to our economy and to the world. We must acknowledge that the patent system does not belong to a narrow set of stakeholders, but to all of us. As specialists, experts, and repeat players in this field, we must acknowledge not only the strengths of our patent system, of which there are many, but also those places where it falls short of its goal of promoting the progress of science and the useful arts. Fixing those areas needing improvement is not a pro-patent thing to do or an anti-patent thing to do. It doesn't mean rewriting the terms of the bargain underlying the patent system as set forth in the Constitution and it's not going to break the patent system. It's about taking the necessary steps 
to ensure that patents remain an important driver of innovation. It's about maintaining the public's faith that the benefits of patents outweigh its cost to society. It's about never seeking, ceasing to speak truth to patents, to think innovatively about how we innovate, which means always striving to make a better system than that which we inherited. I look forward to continuing the discussion with you now and in the coming months, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Uh, let me remind you, if you have questions, please fill out a card that should be in front of you and pass it to someone who's collecting them to make sure we get them all. We have one in the back. And particularly for those of you in the overflow rooms, we want to make sure we get your participation. So by all means, fill out a card, get it to someone. They'll run it back here for us to take a look at. Uh, so we have one question uh, right off the bat. Uh, question is, you said that the PTO's improved financial situation enables the agency to think big on improving patent quality. What's your plan over the longer term if the agency's finances worsen and you have less resources available? Yeah, so thank you for the question who, to whomever had provided it. Um, I mentioned that the American Events Act gave us the authority to set our own fees, and as many of you know, we've done that. So we are now collecting fees at a healthy clip. We also now have what we call an operating reserve fund. So any funds that we do not use end up in this operating reserve fund. And what that means is that even if our revenues fluctuate, or even if, heaven forbid, we're subject to sequestration in the coming years ahead, that operating reserve fund will allow us not to have to cut IT projects, not to have to have examiners stop doing what they were doing. Right? And in last year, when we had sequestration, we had enough reserves in that fund to allow the USPT to remain open to process your applications. But we did have to cut some IT projects. And when you're thinking about a world-class patent quality system, you can imagine the amount of IT support and infrastructure that's needed to do that properly. But what we're saying is right now, with the funds that you, the users, have provided to us, right, we have the ability to weather those through. And I think that's a key difference. Never in the history of the USPTO have we ever had that luxury that I'm aware of. So it's going to make a huge difference. That's great. Uh, another question. What statutory changes to the Patent Act itself would improve patent quality? Well, that was the subject of extensive discussions, I would say, over the past year. Um, and I think if you look at the House bill, uh, the Senate bill, they will certainly give you many ideas there. A lot of them are focused on litigation-related reforms, such as fee shifting. Remember I mentioned the Supreme Court is dealing with that issue. Um, there was heightened pleadings. There was how much discovery should be conducted when, and so on. So there were many issues uh, that uh, were addressed in the legislation, and I anticipate that will continue to be addressed um, in the future. Next question. Um, could you please comment on the ability or the prospects of post-grant review or the inter partes review proceedings to positively affect the troll situation? So that's a good question. Um, pursuant to the American Events Act, there were a number of post-grant review proceedings that came into place. And for those of you who lived through it, myself included, the reason why those procedures were added because, was because Oftentimes, I mean, I know this, I was in-house, I was sitting in the seats of those who are filing patents. You have some idea of what your truly innovative invention is, but oftentimes, due to changes in market forces, you don't really know which of the many patents you file for will be the ultimate one with economic impact for the industry. But with these post-grant proceedings um, that Professor Malone mentions, you can wait, you can see how the market develops, you can see which patents have economic importance and if you take a look at that after the market has determined that that patent has economic importance, and if you don't think it should have issued, you can file these post-grant proceedings before the United States Patent and Trademark Office, rather than going, or in addition to going to district court litigation. And some of the advantages uh, to these proceedings is that they have to be completed by statute within a year, roughly a year, and they are much less expensive, and there's much more much less discovery permitted. So it's a faster, uh, more cost-efficient way of adjudicating the validity of a patent. And also, you get the advantage of three technically trained adjudicators deciding your case. 
And I've been in cases in front of judges in district court and juries in district court. And I don't know, depending upon your, your case, you may welcome that or you may not, depending upon the merits of your case. So I will say, though, that those post-grant proceedings are exceedingly popular at the USPTO. Our filings are up. The petitions are up. I think we had 1,351 filed since the beginning. And we are ramping up for more because our stakeholders are finding them very, very useful. Just a quick, quick follow-up question on that. Uh, if these continue to ramp up, can you say a little about your ability and your resources to, to stay on top of them and to handle them within the statutory period? Uh, we are doing everything we can to meet all the needs of our stakeholders. And so far, we've done a pretty good job. I think uh, the feedback and the sentiment that we've gotten, we've, we went on an eight-city roadshow where we kind of shared some statistics about what we learned about these proceedings, these new proceedings shared some best practices and got a lot of feedback from the public who, who are using these proceedings or who are thinking about using them, and they seem pretty happy with it. So it is a task, it is a challenge ahead of us, but we are up for the task. We are up for the challenge. Great. Can you say a bit about the status of the Silicon Valley uh, PTO headquarters where you were the first uh, director? I'd be glad to. Uh, the Silicon Valley office is near and dear to my heart. <laughs> uh, it's where I uh, started before I went to my current role. and. Um, we are at a really wonderful place with all of our satellite offices. And in fact, after speaking here on Monday, um, we're going to go out and open the permanent location of our Denver satellite office. But speaking about the Silicon Valley office, before this program, I just met with a bunch of our Patent Trial and Appeal Board judges. And you've got an outstanding group of Patent Trial and Appeal Board judges here located in the Silicon Valley. And I got to think there are a lot more from where those came. So our goal is, I think, so those of you who have been following the press know that we've selected and uh, this uh, San Jose City Hall as our permanent location. And all, all the formalities are all signed and all set. And John Kabeca here, the head director of the Silicon Valley office, is going to make sure that we move in, settle in, and transition nicely there. But I've said all along that I view these satellite offices as hubs of innovation, education, and outreach. So it's not just people processing your applications who happen to be located near you. It's an opportunity. We are not taking full advantage of that office if we are simply hiding in a corner, processing your applications, or dealing with your patent, trademark, and appeal board cases. I think, in my vision anyway, and I, I know John shares it, is we are here to listen to what we can do from, for, for you to help meet your needs. And there are so many opportunities here. It, it goes squarely to the issue of patent quality. I mean the better the quality of the patents that come in the door through training that we may offer locally, the better the quality of the patent that issues. If you're able to come in for an in-person examiner interview or an interview via video link to an examiner nationwide, you're going to get a better quality patent, and you're going to get it more quickly. So all these things, I mean, I view the satellite offices as very strategic to the overall mission of the PTO, and I view it as key to our achieving a world-class patent quality system. If we can hire people here who have expertise in the local industries and the local technologies, who have maybe filed a patent themselves or defended against a patent infringement lawsuit and know how these patent assets are used after they leave the office, you still have to follow the 101, 102, 103 case law, but I got to think that's going to help improve quality as well. So I think it's all good, and I'm terribly excited about it, and we're just eager to move to the city of San Jose. Great. Um, are the offices recently issued patentable subject matter examination guidelines going to be withdrawn or revised? Can you please so, comment? So um, are you talking about our guidance for CLS Bank, or are you talking about our Myriad Mayo? Um, uh, unclear <laughs> from the question. I'm guessing it's not the very brand new CLS Bank so guidelines. So let me address both of them. So we issued guidelines um, uh, on the Myriad uh, case. And I think we issued that around April of this year. And then we also had a roundtable uh, receiving input on those guidelines. And we are very much looking uh, at the comments we're reviewing with the possibility of fine tuning, revising, and improving. In fact, just before coming up here, I was down in San Diego at a big international biotech conference. And we heard a lot of input. And the PTO, whatever guidelines we issue, whenever we issue them, right? We evolve them due to developments in case law, due to feedback from the public, and due to examiners. At the end of the day, we have to follow the case law as articulated by the Supreme Court. But on the uh, myriad mail guidance, we are taking a look at those. We're in comment period. If you have comments about them, please do submit them. 
And just very briefly on the CLS Bank ruling, um, I think yesterday or today, our guidance went out. Uh, so keep an eye out for it, the preliminary guidance. And again, we're gonna be uh, welcoming and we will have a Federal Register notice on input on those guidance, the preliminary guidance. So if you have thoughts after you've read it, um, we welcome those inputs. So the next question says, um, good searching of prior art is the key to improving patent quality. Here are two suggestions to improve searching quality. What do you think? First suggestion is do not consider 101 until claims are in the condition for allowance under 102, 103, and 112. And by the way, this will save time and money for the PTO also. Second suggestion is create a cross art unit 101 group to examine allowable claims for 101. Mm -hmm. What do you think? So thanks for those suggestions. Whoever made that suggestion, please come to our round table. Everything is on the table, and I mean everything. So you know, as you know, the first topic has been discussed a lot in the jurisprudence and so forth. But honestly, we're looking at everything. And if you have those ideas and you have other ideas, we're going to welcome your input, and we'll discuss them in detail. So this is probably not the right venue to dig into those questions, but um, we are looking for that sort of input. One more question, or how many more? Yeah, try to do two or three more. If you have questions, last chance, please write them down quickly, get them to somebody, and they'll get them up here uh, to us so we can get them asked, especially those of you in the satellite room. Uh, this question says, you mentioned several times, quote, abusive patent litigation, end quote, and, quote, legitimate stakeholders, end quote. Can you give your definition of both of these terms? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to try. I'm not going to try. <laughs> All right. We'll see how we do with this one. Uh, this question says, uh, I believe, the questioner believes, there's a conflict between pharma and IT on how the patent system should be improved. I believe this is the result of patent assertion activities being led mainly by operating companies in pharma and trolls in the IT space. Do you think we should explore creation of different patent models that are customized for each industry? Yeah, so thank you for that question. I mean, for those of us who lived through the discussions for the American Vents Act negotiations, right, and even now, right, during the second round of legislative reform, um, different industries have different perspectives on the patent system, and yet we have one patent system for all of us. So I think the trick is to try to have balanced reform, right? It's gotta be a system that works for us all. Otherwise, if you start splintering according to technology areas, it's so hard to define what falls into what technology areas. And increasingly, these technology areas are merging together. So what do you do? You get an application and it has a combination of software and some other kind of technology. I mean, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna split it between examiners? What rules do you apply? So we've always had a unitary patent system. And just because we've always had it doesn't mean we should always have it in the future. And I clearly see the tension because in the latest round of patent legislative reform discussions, right, sitting where I sat, I heard all the arguments. And they were all genuine arguments about what would help people's industries and what would hurt. But still, I think um, the achievement of a unitary patent system, that is balanced. That works for everyone. That is then tweaked and fine-tuned in the case law development is probably a sensible way to go. Maybe one other way to try the question about abusive patent litigation. Can, uh, can you say anything about what makes litigation abusive? Not so much defining the term, but the, the things that make litigation abusive? Yeah, I think, I mean, I will take a shot at that. I mean, I think taking a patent and stretching the meaning beyond that which was originally intended and that which is in the face of the document is abusive. I think bringing those claims and asserting it against unsophisticated people and saying, look, it will only cost you $3,000 if you just write a check for me right now and it'll cost you a lot more to hire a lawyer. I think those are abusive techniques. Um, those are just some examples and uh, you know there have been attempts in the legislation to address some of those issues and I can tell you the USPTO is definitely um, you know, on the initiative of patent claim clarity, the clearer we get those patents, as I said, 
the less the opportunity for abusive litigation and the greater the ability for innovation. So patent quality rests heavily on the quality of the examination process, says this questioner. Uh, besides appeals and the Ombudsman's process, how can applicants and attorneys let the PTO know that certain examiners maybe don't have the education or training <laughs> they need or are not applying it correctly during the examination process without worrying about a negative backlash for so, their cases? Yeah, so no, I appreciate the question. And it's actually, it's a valid question, right? So if you don't think that you and your examiner are communicating, are working well together, or what have you, for whatever reason, right? Doesn't matter, right or wrong. We have a patent ombudsman program where you can escalate it to somebody else. And you know you don't have to worry about the ramifications to your case, but we'll take a look at it. We'll have somebody else take a look at it, and we'll try to move the case forward. But I will say that, you know, yes, patent quality in part hinges upon the patent examiners to a large degree and the PTO, but a lot of it rests in your hands, the applicant's hands, right? In your proceedings, in your interactions, how clearly you define things, how much, right, you're willing to put down on paper, right? I mean, the better the quality of the patent application that comes in the door, quite frankly, the better the quality of the patent that issues. So it, we're in this together, right? The PTO can take certain measures and steps, and we absolutely sure will we'll do. If you're having problems with an examiner, go to the patent ombudsman program. We'll take care of it. We'll make sure that we get you um, somebody who can work with you on these issues. But that's only a piece of it. So I'll leave it at that. Right, and we will leave it at that. Thank you all so much for your questions. Thank you, Ms. Lee, for your presentation.